Hello, everyone, and welcome back. What I want to talk about now is Fierre's theorem and the uh, Hilbert space theory of Fourier series. So this video might be a little longer than the other ones just because it really only makes sense to uh, discuss the two together. Okay, so um, let me talk about Fierre's theorem. So first, part of this lecture um, is to introduce a, a philosophy that uh, you, you sometimes use here and there in analysis, different areas of analysis, uh, and that's, um, it might be useful to average things. It, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's often just useful to try and average things in some way and somehow. When I say average, I mean maybe take the expectation of a random variable. Uh, maybe, um, you know, in the sense of uh, integration, uh, integrate over uh, a set of finite positive measure and divide by the measure of that set. Uh, maybe take the uh, finite average. So, for example, uh, you know, uh, with central limit theorem, we've all seen this before. You have a sequence of IIDs. Um, you average that, you take the limit, then, you know, in measure, you have convergence to a Gaussian with, um, I forget exactly what the, uh, well, the mean is just the mean of your IIDs, and uh, I think it's the same standard deviation uh, or um, something like that. But anyway, the, the point is, if you have IIDs, uh, identically, um, uh, independent identically distributed random variables, you take the limit, you, you take the average and you, you, you know, uh, take the limit of the average, then things become much more manageable. So we're going to introduce this idea within the context of uh, sequences. So, um, yeah, so first, let's make an observation that if I have a convergent sequence of complex numbers and I average the xn's, then in the limit, the average is still going to converge to x. And so here's the idea. The idea is that if we have a sequence, let's just look at this. Let's just look at um, what I'm going to circle. Let's just look at um, averages of my sequence. Okay. And the idea is, what's the harm? maybe the average as big N goes to infinity will converge to something. Certainly we're not gonna harm convergence if the original sequence is convergent. This is exactly what I'm claiming, that if uh, we have the sequence Xn converging to X, then the averages converge to X, so we have done no harm if Xn converges. It converges to the same thing, the averages. All right, so why is this true? Um, and I probably should leave this for homework because uh, it's really easy, but um, there's just, you know, especially with everyone, including myself, stressed out with having more things to do than usual, can't really give you too much homework. So anyway, all right, so what we're gonna do is uh, make the fairly trivial observation that um, X equals this sum here, uh, sorry, need room for the one over big N. And we've done throughout this course, you know, various incarnations of this, you know, fairly trivial trick. Um, so really all I'm doing here is saying if I sum up X N times, I get N X, divide by N, I get X. So this is really, uh, this, you know, we're not really doing anything here. So I should mention um, any kind of trick like this, writing one in uh, a, a kind of funky way as an integral, as a sum, you, you do that a lot in analysis and that's often called a resolution of the identity. Okay, so, right, we do that. And so this here is going to be the sum here. And with this being done, we can smash in absolute values. So let's say epsilon is bigger than zero. Pick some big M where 
Uh, this is less than epsilon. If little n is bigger than big M, nothing. Just, you know, obviously just definition of convergence of xn to x. And yeah, let's, let's call this uh, star here, this whole thing. <clears throat> so star is going to be equal to, well, let's break up the sum from n equals zero to m, n to m plus one, n minus one. So I am implicitly assuming big N is bigger than big M. Um, so we can certainly do this. And well, so first of all, Xn is convergent, so it's bounded. So this whole thing here, and when I say bounded, it's bounded independent of little n. So this whole thing here is bounded independent of little n. Let's say the bound is big C. So this is this term here that I'm putting into a uh, rectangle is bounded by C. Well, there's m plus one of these. So this circle here is bounded by C. Some reason I almost wrote big M. Okay, so you add that up uh, m plus one times, it's c m plus one. Well, that's not good. M might be big, but big N is there to save the day in the bottom. So it's just c m plus one over N. This one here, you really don't have to do anything um, because little n is bigger than m. Each one of these terms is less than epsilon. Okay, so, um, well, you sum this up. Certainly there is less than n terms in this whole thing. And uh, actually, sorry, that should be epsilon over two. Not a big deal, but anyway. So, um, Right, so just pull out the epsilon over two, you have the big N here, and this is certainly less than or equal to, well, big N over big N. This sum here is obviously less than or equal to big N. So, right, so you get this here. Um, so all you do is set big N to be the maximum of these two, and you're done. And it's fairly trivial that the converse is false in the sense that if the average of Xn converges as big N goes to infinity, that certainly doesn't mean Xn itself converges to anything. And there's a million examples you can come up with, not very subtle. So a typical example um, is, let's say we have Xn is minus one to the N plus one. So, um, right, so we take the sum here, this is trivially minus one of n is even, big N, zero of big N is odd. So certainly the averages converge to zero, um, really nothing to that. And this is obviously divergent, it doesn't converge. Another trivial example would just be xn equals one for any n. The sum here would just be big N, Big N over big N is one. So this limit here would be one, even though Xn itself blows up. Um, so right, so what we have here is um, a way to um, assign a number to certain sequences that may or may not converge. If, they, if the sequence converges, then um, this process gives us the limit. If the sequence doesn't converge, it, you know, this, this process may or may not converge. This process being averaging from n equals zero to big N. And uh, this is called actually, um, uh, if you Google this, Fier summation, um, that's what the process is called. This was a process created by this, Hungarian mathematician Fier, um, that's his last name, in the early 1900s. 
And so this is exactly the situation we're in with Fourier series. We don't know if Fourier series point-wise converges or not. We, we don't we really know. We have some tests, but if we don't have convergence of Fourier series, do we have an alternative? And this provides us with an excellent alternative. And I should say, Fierre really came up with this idea for Fourier series. Okay. Um, and there are other uh, processes for assigning a number to divergent uh, sequences. Um, one is um, you have a sequence and you associate it to uh, an analytic function, and then you do analytic continuity. Um, and because analytic continuity is unique, um, you plug in a number into that function and you get something associated to a divergent se uh, sequence. For example, there's, you know, if you, you can look up uh, some of the integers equals minus one half, I think, or minus one over 12, something like that. Um, and you, there's this really bizarre video on, you know, trying to you know, justify it. It's obviously a click clickbait video, um, but it's fun. But anyway, what they're doing is analytic continuation of um, the Riemann zeta function and then plugging in, I um, believe you plug in uh, one into that, which te te technically gives you, um, you know, a, div a divergent series, one plus two plus three plus four uh, or, or something like that. And then, um, um, Right, so, so it's really the analytic continuation of the Riemann zeta function, uh, but anyway. Okay, so, um, right, so let's try this uh, with Fourier series. So I don't know why this is called sigma uh, when I take the average of the partial Fourier sums, but that's just, this is what textbooks use, so who am I to argue it? Okay, so this is really nice because we have everything explicit, very explicit. So let's see what happens. So I write out the partial sum, and I believe before I had uh, it's x plus t. But as I mentioned in the previous video, uh, regardless, you just do a very easy substitution, and this is going to be equal to. Um, x minus t. Right, so and it's very useful for us to have x minus t. Okay, so right, so just write out what the partial sum is, s little n of f, it's this integral f of x minus t times the Dirichlet um, kernel dt. All right, so we just do something trivial, bring in the summation inside the integral, bring in the one over big N. And this is called big FN. Uh, it's called the Fier kernel. All right, so let's figure out what this is. And as we'll see, and this is kind of a, a lucky miracle, um, that this function here behaves much nicer than the Dirichlet kernel. There's no immediate reason why this should behave better than the Fier kernel, um, but as we'll see, it will. All right, so what do we do? Well, you can either do one of two things, like in the homework, you can either uh, argue by writing sine as a complex exponential. Uh, in this case, it might be a little easier to, um, well, just uh, take sine pi 2n plus 1t as the imaginary part of e to the um, pi i 2n plus 1 t. And you can always bring out the imaginary part out of a sum, it's trivial. Okay, and if you do that, um, factor out an e to the i pi uh, t. So you get uh, e to the two pi i n t, and now use geometric series. Uh, as usual, this is my r, before. So it's e, 1 minus e to 2 pi i, big N minus 1 plus 1 raised to the t. 
which is just e to the 2 pi i big N T over 1 minus r, 1 minus 2 pi e to the i t. All right, so what I'm going to do is um, write this term here in the denominator, so pretend it's not there. So this is really e to the minus pi i t, and I'm going to distribute this. So it's e to the minus uh, i pi t, uh, e to the minus pi i t. And I'm going to now do the same thing in the numerator, factor out a e to the pi i and t. Well, not exactly the same thing. And then I'm going to, well, yeah, I mean, you can just distribute this here and check. Now you get 1 minus e to the pi, 2 pi i and t. Okay, uh, well, sorry, it's a little bit, pretend you didn't see that, you don't want a spoiler alert. So let me get rid of all of this, because I'm going to write in a second. All right, so it's fairly trivial that this whole thing here, divide everything by 2 pi, uh, and minus top and bottom, this is going to be, uh, yeah, I can fit this in, sine n pi t over sine pi t. And this is really nice because what I circled here is real. It's trivial because it's sine n pi t over sine pi t. But that means that the imaginary part of this whole thing here is the imaginary part of this thing that I am underlining here, which obviously is sine n pi t. So we have in the numerator sine n pi t, sine n pi t over sine pi t, which is sine squared n pi t over sine pi t. But you'll notice that we have a sine pi here. So we have two sine big N pi t's in the numerator. We have two sine pi t's in the denominator. So that gives us that this fair kernel is one over big N times this whole thing squared, or if you prefer, um, maybe it's more familiar to write as sine squared, sine squared like this. Doesn't matter. Okay. And this is fairly remarkable because this is bigger or equal to zero. And that's very important. As we'll see, this is extremely important. And it's not at all trivial. It's not at all immediate that this should be true. Um, in fact, when you look at this, you know, if you, if you didn't, do this this computation there is no immediate reason on planet earth why this should be non-negative it just you know it, by some like i said some some you know hopeful miracle it turns out that you know this is non-negative all right so what we've done is we've written the uh, average of the partial Fourier sums as this integral here, where a big Fn is this kernel, this, this uh, function here. So let's write down two key properties. So first of all, if I integrate zero to one with absolute value of Fn, well, you can get rid of the absolute values because what's inside the absolute values is not negative. So that's absolutely trivial. Uh, on the other hand, this is extremely important because, um, well, right, so what is big Fn? Remember big Fn of t is uh, one over big N, uh, I should write so fast, N equals zero to N minus one of d N of t. So if I integrate this from zero to one, I can trivially swap integration and sum. Well, what is each of these integrals? Each of these integrals we've done uh, way back is one. So when you sum up one n times, you get big N. Divide by big N, we get one. So 
Um, right. So we have a non-negative kernel, a non-negative function that sums to one. And this is in, in dramatic contrast with the Dirichlet kernel, because remember, um, if you integrate zero to one, the Dirichlet kernel uh, with absolute values inside, well, remember that this uh, behaves, it it's grows uh, like uh, the um, harmonic series, the partial harmonic series, k equals one to n, one over k, so that this blows up uh, like natural log n, as n goes to infinity, versus this here, which is one. I mean, I have big N here and I have little N here, but whatever. Okay, so now we can do the same trick that we've done before. Um, we can write uh, F of X as F of X zero to one, big F N of T DT and uh, we can pull in f of x. So here, uh, well, here just let's, f of x is just some function. Uh, and if that's just defined almost everywhere, then just, um, this is going to be true for almost every x. So yeah, pull this in. We have this here. This is what uh, sigma n is. And so, um, right, we can uh, make this into one integral and now we're going to smash in absolute values which we were not able to do with the Dirichlet kernel um, because the Dirichlet kernel did not satisfy this integral for each big n equals one <clears throat> okay so let me prove a very general well sorry that's um, before I prove anything. What's the second key property here? The second key property here is that for any positive delta, this integral here, so we know from zero to one, it's one. But I claim no matter how small delta is, this converges to zero as n goes to infinity. Now, the smaller little delta is, the larger big N has to be for this whole thing to be small, but that's okay. For fixed delta, as N goes to infinity, this integral is going to converge to zero. So why is that true? Well, it's fairly trivial. Just plop in for big Fn. Um, the numerator is... Uh, you know, obviously less than or equal to one when you square it. Uh, the denominator, well, I mean, we know what sign uh, pi t is going to be from uh, zero to one. So, uh, right, so one half. Not exactly drawn too well. Probably would be unhappy if a Calc 1 student drew that. But anyway, right. So, um, a way, so we know um, that, well, sine zero, sine pi is, is zero. So that's, that's kind of the problematic denominator part. But uh, if we're away from zero and if we're away from one, then this sine pi t is bounded below by sine uh, delta times pi. Okay, so this is going to be one over big N sine squared delta pi, and that's positive, sine squared delta pi. I mean, it's basically, as delta gets smaller and smaller and smaller, it's going to be like one over delta pi, but that's fine because as N goes to infinity, this is going to go to zero. So again, you know, obviously, from this estimate, as delta gets smaller and smaller and smaller, we need big N to be smaller and smaller and smaller to get close to zero. But for fixed delta, when we let N go to infinity, we get zero. All right, so let's prove a very general theorem on what's called approximate identities. 
Uh, usually this is for all of RD, uh, all of Euclidean space, and virtually the same proof works. Um, and this, is, this will lead to the concept of a mollifier, which I'll talk about very briefly at the end of this video, which is extremely important in PDE theory and something, you know, I'm actually working on PDEs right now, uh, which, you know, something called the Schrodinger operator um, and uh, Schrodinger equations um, are really time independent Schrodinger equation with a potential. Um, and this is, you know, this concept of mollifiers is used all the time in sublev spaces, PDEs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, stuff we would talk about in this course if we had all the time in the world, but we don't, so we can't. Anyway, so let's say I have a sequence of FNs. They're, they're just anything. They, they're not necessarily this Fier kernel. Let's just say it's a sequence of L1 functions indexed by the natural numbers that are non-negative and that all integrate to one and satisfy this condition that the Fier kernel did. Then I claim that convolution with F, and what do I mean by that? This here, um, so this is going to be zero to one particularly because we're on zero to one, usually you're integrating over Rn, Rd, whatever, uh, whatever letter you want for your dimension. So this is going to be uh, f of x minus t, <coughs> big Fn of t, exactly what we had for the Fier kernel. Okay. <clears throat> so in particular, um, let's right, we have the average partial Fourier series converges in LP to any uh, LP function if P is between one and infinity. And better yet, if we have a continuous periodic function that's bounded on the real line, one periodic, then the um, average of the partial Fourier series converges uniformly to the function which is in stark contrast to the Fourier series itself, which we, you know, mentioned and proved carefully, um, you know, that if you have a prescribed countable subset of zero to one, then the set of all functions whose Fourier series diverge at that prescribed, on each of those prescribed points is dense in this space here. So, so averaging the partial Fourier series and seeing what happens there dramatically improves convergence versus looking at just the Fourier series. And this really has deep, deep consequences. I mean, it's interesting unto itself. It definitely answers the question, um, can we approximate functions in LP or continuous, fun continuous bounded periodic functions? Um, you know, using complex exponentials or using sines and cosines, this answers the question absolutely, because if we take the average of Fourier series, that's in the span of, you know, sines and cosines, trivially. But this also has very deep consequence for the uh, L2 theory of uh, Fourier series. <clears throat> uh, so I don't want to do a spoiler, uh, but anyway. So how do we prove this? This is actually fairly straight. Well, it's, it's not too difficult. So first of all, let's extend F to a periodic function on the real line. So let's prove A. B will be an easy homework. Um, we'll, we'll do most of the work for B even, um, but okay. And, and so what do I mean by that is F is defined almost everywhere on zero to one. Take any almost, take any, you know, um, copy of F on zero to one, almost everywhere, extend it to one to two, extend it to minus one to one. Um, we, we just want almost everywhere F to be equal on all these intervals uh, with uh, integer endpoints. So just like we did before. Okay. Um, Right, so just like we did before, because 
uh, the integral of big Fn for any n is 1. We can write f of x in this way. So then convolution minus f of x, like before, we can write in this way. And now we smash in absolute values. Okay, so what we do is we break up the integral. Well, sorry, before we do that, you can either do one of two things. Uh, I don't know if people have seen abstract integration or um, if you have, you could just treat big Fn of T dt as a um, probability measure um, because it is a probability measure. The integral is one and you can do Holder's inequality with respect to that probability measure. Uh, if that doesn't mean anything to you, it's okay. We can just break up big Fn in this way uh, here. Because P is bigger than one, it has a conjugate exponent. So one over P plus one over P prime is equal to one. And P is bigger than one. And it's less than infinity. So both P and P prime are real numbers bigger than one. So now we do Holder's inequality. <clears throat> um, for each n, this is equal to 1. 1 to the 1 over p prime is 1. So either way, we arrive at the same conclusion that um, for fixed x, the convolution minus f of x is equal to, or less than or equal to, this here. And this is nice. This 1 over p here is wonderful because when we take this here for a fixed x, when we take it to the p, what are we doing? We're raising everything to the p and they cancel. So when we integrate with respect to x, we can use Fubini's theorem because everything is nice and non-negative. There's no issue at all with Fubini's theorem. Right, so we, we do that, <clears throat> we get exactly this here, and then using Fubini's theorem, we interchange the order. And let's say this whole thing here is star. All right, so let's say epsilon is positive, and let's pick delta where this is true. If t is small in absolute value, then this integral here, the integral of the difference is less than epsilon over two. I believe this was a prelim problem or maybe F was assumed to be in L. Um, I think in the prelim, this was uh, on the real line and F was assumed to be LP of the real line. Um, anyway, this is really, really easy. Um, this is gonna be a homework problem. And uh, all you do is approximate your L1, your LP function by a continuous function on, let's say, um, so you can treat F as a, because F is an LP of zero to one, it's trivially uh, an LP function on uh, minus one to two, just outside of zero to one, say it's zero. So you, um, extend, yeah, so, so, sorry, um, you approximate f as an LP function on minus one to two by a continuous function on minus one to two, and then this is trivial for uh, continuous functions um, just by uniform continuity, <clears throat> and basically that's the proof. Um, so this, yeah, it's an easy proof. Um, and I'll leave this for homework. Uh, and so you might, I, I want to make a comment about homework. You might be wondering why I'm giving homework that's only tangentially related to the central theme that we're doing here and all these proofs. And that's because when you start looking at research papers, there's going to be a lot of tangential, you know, this is left as an exercise. This is easy. That's easy. Um, and it's really, in my opinion, extremely important to be able to fill in those details uh, because in, in harmonic analysis, PD, et cetera, et cetera, yes, the, the central theme uh, of what's going on is important, but 
details really, really matter. Technical details are extremely important and sometimes make the difference between absolutely correct and just miserably doesn't work. So anyway, okay, so if we, I uh, didn't want to do that, sorry. So if we did it again, anyway. So if we employ this, for this fixed delta, we're going to break this double integral up into two pieces. And we're going to, first of all, I'm going to bring out, uh, ooh, sorry about that. <clears throat> so there should be a big Fn of t here that didn't just magically disappear. Sorry about that. Okay, so what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to bring this out because it is constant with respect to x integration. So nothing too crazy here. So after I do that, I'm going to break up the t integral into two parts. One part is delta to 1 minus delta. Another part is 0 to delta 1 minus 1 delta to 1. <clears throat> okay, so let's call this one and two. All right, so I think this video is going to end up being a little longer than uh, I would have liked, but that's okay. Um, okay, so let's first uh, actually, um, yeah, sorry, let's first look at two. Okay, so first of all, for two, this is going to be zero to delta and one minus delta to one, but we're periodically extending this function. So we can take the integral um, with respect to t. So as a function of t, everything is f of x minus t for fixed x and big Fn of t is, they're both one periodic, because again, we're extending f uh, to all the real line periodically. So we can subtract one uh, from, or rather we can take this integral over this uh, interval of length one. We can take the integral over any um, interval of length one. So here t is going to be uh, less than delta in absolute value. So I don't care what t is. For every t in both of these integrals, this whole thing here by uh, the homework is going to be less than epsilon, uh, yeah, less than epsilon. Okay, and now we uh, do as we typically do. Uh, now that we've thrown out an epsilon, I don't care if this is integration on a small interval, um, we can even say this is less than two epsilon, two from, yeah, replace zero delta with zero to one, replace minus delta zero with zero to one. Uh, and this is gonna be equal to, because for each n this equals to one, it's two epsilon. Okay, and now we handle one, uh, let's make a trivial observation. You've probably done this before, but if not, then it's okay. And this is a useful thing every now and then. So let's say I have two complex numbers, S and T. I want to get an estimate on this, smash an absolute values. And let's write this as one times absolute, absolute value of S, one times absolute value of T. Let's use discrete holders inequality uh, with respect to one at one, one, and S, T in absolute value. So use P with respect to S and T. Use P prime with respect to one and one. This adds up to two, that's trivial. One P prime is one. The P on the outside comes along for the ride. So this gives us a very useful, if not, very, you know, somewhat crude estimate. Uh, P 
kind of, you know, first smashing in app, smashing in the P. And if this, there was N terms, this would be, uh, well, N ones here. So it would be N to the P over P prime. And this is often very useful when you have a sum and let's say you have something that decays exponentially, then you can often do this at the expense of N to the P over P prime. P over P prime could be very large if P is um, itself uh, very large and hence P prime is very close to one. But you know, you still have power decay versus, you have power growth versus exponential decay. So anyway, so here we only have two things to look at, so we don't have anything like that. But something like this is in research, something to keep in mind. Um, I, I've used it before. Okay, so uh, yeah, and this should be one. One is less than or equal to, well, do just this with respect to uh, this is here uh, S and this here is T. Okay, and um, well, right, so I, I should have another, well, let me put another uh, parentheses here. So for fixed T, the reason why I wanna do this is when I take the integral zero to one of f of x minus t dt, again, we've extended f periodically. <clears throat> so you can do a uh, trivial substitution, u is uh, x minus t, and uh, you will get that this is going to be equal to, um, Make sure I get this right. This is going to be x to um, uh, sorry. This is going to be x minus one to x of f of um, x. Um, so over a bit x dx, and again because this is one periodic. Same thing as the integral, uh, sorry, p's didn't magically go away. And whatever this is, this is f lp on zero to one to the p. So this is the lp norm of f, uh, I can make that a little more legible. So not a terribly subtle estimate, but it gets the job done. So we get, so, well, it's two times, because we have, you know, this is just LP, LP. Um, so we get two, that's where this plus one comes, two times the LP norm of F to the P, times this integral here, and I don't care what delta is, delta certainly does depend on F, but F is just some LP function, it's fixed, we can let n go to infinity to get zero. So what does this tell us about this limb soup? Well, it's less than two epsilon plus zero for any epsilon, and hence the limb soup is zero, and hence the limit is zero. Okay, and B, like I said, is for homework. You basically do the same thing. You get down to this point here, um, and you do really the same kind of thing. You break the integral up in virtually the same way using continuity. <clears throat> um, yeah, so we're not, sorry, you don't, you don't break up the integral. Um, you just consider, um, uh, let's see. Um, well, anyway, so I'll give some hints, um, had a little brain fart there. I'll give some hints for the homework. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so yeah, let's get into some consequences of this. 
So an immediate corollary, which is called Fierre's theorem, is that if P is between one and infinity, then we have a uh, convergence of the um, averaged partial Fourier sum to F and LP. And if F is bounded, continuous, periodic, then the, you know, the partial Fourier series, partial average Fourier, the, the average of the partial Fourier series, excuse me, converges uniformly to F on zero to one. Uh, and the proof, there's really nothing to do. We've basically already proved it. Uh, you know, sigma n of f is exactly this here, um, which is exactly convolution with this Dirichlet kernel. And this Dirichlet kernel satisfies one and two. So, yeah. And again, most emphatically, the, uh, sorry, the fear, I think I said Dirichlet kernel, the fear kernel, the big FN is the fear kernel. The Dirichlet kernel most emphatically does not satisfy one and two, as I mentioned. Um, one is completely false. Um, well, first of all, Dirichlet kernel is not negative. And second of all, this integral here, if you have, if, you know, um, if you put, if you have D here, Dn with absolute values, it blows up as n goes to infinity. Um, so, yeah. And of course, as I should have mentioned, this is for any natural number n. Um, okay, right. So let's talk about some Hilbert space consequences, which is pretty surprising. Um, all right. So yeah, let's prove a very very deep theorem, which on the surface has absolutely nothing to do with this Fierre. Um, theorem. And this is actually in any textbook on Hilbert space theory, uh, any textbook on functional analysis. Um, this is how it's proved, uh, uh, you know, constructing this orthonormal or proving that exponent complex exponentials and thus sines and cosines are an orthonormal basis for L2. So let's prove this. And the proof is pretty easy. So let's say, um, yeah, let's call this, I don't want to write this too often. Let's call this EK. Um, so let's check that, first of all, this is an orthonormal system in L2. And that's, we've basically done this already. So I'm not going to really comment too much about this. So the, or, you know, the, well, it's the usual L2 norm, usual L2 in a product. Um, so, Right, this is going to be one if n equals m, because you're just integrating one, and it's zero if n is not equal to m. So this is an orthonormal system. Now you will recall from functional analysis that an orthonormal system is an orthonormal basis if and only if the span, the finite span of the EKs the finite span of this orthonormal system is dense in your Hilbert space. Um, so this is a very non-trivial, very uh, important result. Um, and this is the key here. So really, and this is, maybe it was difficult to appreciate in functional analysis, but the fact that we can check this here, just using the span is, extremely useful in practice. Why? And what the hell does this have to do with the Ayer's theorem? Well, let's take an F and L2. Let's write out what sigma n is. I actually said this in words, but just to make sure the point is absolutely clear, I'm gonna write this out. Well, this is just the average of the partial Fourier series. And the partial Fourier series is just, well, it's just f hat of k e to 2 pi i kx. Well, not so subtly, and this is absolutely trivial. This is in S, where S here is the span. And I mean, and when I say span, again, finite span. And, and there's nothing to this. There's nothing to prove here. Each one of these 
well, this is EK. So this is a linear combination of the EKs. And hence, sigma NF is in the span of the EKs, the finite span. It's a finite linear combination. And we've proven that sigma NF converges to F and L2. So that means S is dense in, um, uh, sorry, that doesn't make sense. It's dense in L2 of 0 to 1. And yeah, as I said, this is really how you prove, um, well, oh, sorry, let me, let me just continue on. Uh, sorry, yeah. So, um, right, so this is really how you prove that in functional analysis textbooks, like this is also the base in L2. So for the purposes of proving that, you really don't care that the free, you know, the, the sigma n is what converges to f in L2. You just care that the span is dense. But to my knowledge, this is the easiest way to prove that the span is dense in L2. I, I'm not sure of, I'm not aware of an easier way to prove this fact. If there is an easier way, I'd be curious what it is, um, but um, yeah. Okay, and so an immediate but really interesting corollary is that if F is an L2, then we have L2 convergence of the original Fourier series. We don't need to do this averaging trick. <clears throat> and so this is really, this is really interesting. Um, it all comes down to this really, uh, as it often does, comes down to this really beautiful functional analysis elementary but beautiful functional analysis kind of tool that you can check something as an orthonormal basis if the span is dense. Okay, so using this elementary functional analysis tool, we can use convergence in L2 of the averaged partial Fourier series to get actual L2 convergence of the Fourier series. And the proof is, uh, really nothing. Um, and we also have, and this is really just Hilbert space theory, um, that F goes to the Fourier coefficients is, uh, is an isometric isometry, and thus the L2 norm of F is given by the little L2 norm of the Fourier coefficients, which is a very useful fact in real and applied mathematics. So proof of, well, we know the EKs are an orthonormal basis. And this is, uh, this is an L2 of zero to one. Uh, fairly obvious, but anyway. Right, so by Hilbert space theory, we know F is uh, its expansion in terms of its orthonormal basis. Uh, but, I mean, what is f hat of k? f hat of k is 0 to 1 f of t e to the minus 2 pi i k t. And this is exactly this inner product here. So this expansion of Fourier series is exactly um, just a Hilbert space expansion. And this is, not a, this is not a very subtle thing. I mean, um, we basically used L2 orthogonality to derive the formula for Fourier series, uh, or rather to derive this Fourier coefficient formula. Um, but um, yeah, so I mean, that's exactly what we did. We basically did L2 um, orthogonality. We just didn't really want to you know, I didn't want to state it in those terms because, well, you know, we needed some theory to get to the Dirichlet kernel, the Fierre kernel, the Dirichlet kernel, et cetera, et cetera. Um, right, so that takes care of that. <clears throat> and uh, two, like I said, it's just using the fact that um, this here is f hat 
of k. This here is just something for any orthonormal basis, f maps to its, uh, the, you know, the orthonormal basis coefficients, that's an isometric isomorphism from your Hilbert space to little l2, and this is no different. All right, so I want to end with two comments. First of all, as I mentioned, um, usually this approximation of the identity business is done on, uh, on Euclidean space, because that's in practice what you often want. Uh, sorry about that. This should be uh, RD. Okay, so you have basically uh, the same result. Um, and I'll probably leave this as a homework. Um, probably I'll make this as a homework, and you, if you so desire, you can do uh, the, the part of Fier's theorem for homework. Uh, really, it's virtually the same proof. Um, and I also want to mention what is often done in uh, particularly PDE theory is you pick an F and L1, non-negative, this is called mollification. Uh, I know Professor, without even asking him, I know Professor Bachan who has done this in his course. Um, so yeah, you pick, uh, rather you pick an F that has a L1 norm that's, uh, uh, positive almost everywhere. In practice, you're picking something very concrete and very, you know, point-wise defined. Usually it's like a uh, uh, Gaussian, usually often, not often, I mean, it's often a Gaussian uh, centered at zero um, with, um, well, mean zero, standard deviation one. And then what you now do is uh, you say f n of x, or um, yeah, you can do it like this. This is going to be, um, let's see, uh, n to the uh, d big F of n x. This is often stated in terms of epsilon, so it would be uh, one over epsilon to the d, x over epsilon. So you can think uh, epsilon is one over big N. But anyway, this is going to satisfy this condition here and also this condition here. So yeah, so this is often what you do in PDE. This is called mollification, if you wanna look that up. <clears throat> 